Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to our Tuesday Lunch and Learn class. Uh, today is going to be Rags to Real Estate, our Q&A with Curtis Warden and Derek Long. Uh, before we get started, my name's Nicole Faneff. I'm one of the certified IRA specialists in at Quest Trust Company. Um, I'm primarily in the marketing department. Um, but before we go ahead and get started on the Q&A, um, I'm going to go over just a couple of quick little things couple quick little announcements that we can get right into the Q&A portion. I don't have a presentation or anything like that, so it'll be really fast. So first thing I want to mention, if anybody has heard of Quest Trust Company, I'm sure you have, you're on this platform, but if this is your first time visiting, first off, welcome. Second off, I want you to go ahead and go to questtrust.com. Um, at the end of this Q&A, if you liked it, if you want to learn more about how we do events at Quest, we are about 98% free when it comes to any of our events. So go to questtrust.com and go to our events tab. You'll be able to see different kinds of information from real estate to uh, multifamily, single family home, notes, you name it. Uh, and there's likely a class on it. So we do uh, two webinars a week. We host live and in-person classes um, also hybrid. So it's all streams online too, three times a month in each of our offices. And then also a, a happy hour at the fourth Wednesday of every month. So we have a lot of stuff going on. So if you want to be part of it, go ahead and get on to questtrust.com, look at our events tab and just RSVP for the ones that you have or want. Um, next, I want to kind of go over what we have going on right now. So I'm kind of in events right now, and I'm sure Derek is going to talk more about it a little bit later, but we do have our Quest Expo is finally returning uh, since the pandemic had started. So we started this in 2018. It was a huge success, had 600, 700 people there. 2019, we did it again in Houston. We had 800 people there. And then now we're doing it September 23rd through 25th in the Houston at the Weston Galleria. And our expected attendance is 1,000 ticket sales. So make sure you get your early bird tickets right now. Uh, this is basically, we have about 40 to 50 different vendors, speakers, panelists, keynotes, all coming in from across the country, coming to uh, teach you about different kinds of um uh, topics in the alternative investing world. This could be things like short-term rentals, Airbnbs, um, just real estate in general, syndications, multifamily. And now that we're officially going to be launching crypto uh, in their Quest IRA in early March, we will be having a lot of topics related to cryptocurrency as an alternative investment. So this is absolutely something you do not want to miss. So go ahead and go to questexpo.com and get your early bird tickets now. Um, the other thing that I wanted to go over, actually, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and introduce everybody. Let's go ahead and get the ball rolling here. So as I mentioned before, we have uh, today is a Q&A with Curtis Warden and Derek Long. So Curtis Warden has been investing in Houston real estate since about uh, 2007. Uh, he's a custom home builder in Houston, in the Houston Heights area with expertise in value, add opportunities, historic properties, and renovating distressed assets. He also has a podcast called Nailed It with Curtis Warden, which I believe that's where they are right now, actually. Um, so you'll also have Derek Long, too. He's one of our IRA specialists here at Quest Trust Company uh, in our sales department, one of our very top IRA specialists. So I'm really excited to see what you guys have today. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Nicole. So appreciate it. Hey, guys. Uh, so for today, uh, this is all for you. All right. Understand that Curtis and I here, we're going to answer uh, any questions you guys ask. I don't care what it's related to as long as it's related to, I'm going to call it investing. Is that fair? Well, I love the rags to riches. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's like my story in a nutshell. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to banter back and forth a little bit. Uh, Derek has been on my podcast, nailed it once again. Thank you, Nicole. Yeah. Um, Derek, you've been on my podcast three times. We talk about crypto a lot. I'm super excited to hear more about um, the crypto as long as well as talk about real estate and what's going on. Yeah. So, guys, uh, what's going to happen is post your questions down below. We're going to answer any questions, whatever it's related to, and we're just going to kind of dive right on in. So I preloaded a couple of questions, Curtis. But I think you and I fall in different categories for some of these. Okay. Okay, good. So too bad they didn't give us any whiskey. They only gave us water. Well, it's vodka. <laughs> oh, is that what it is? <laughs> well, <if> you think, <laughs> just pretend. Pretend. Got it. I'm going to post the first question that just kind of we always get 
asked a lot, you know, is as a real estate entrepreneur, do you feel that you had to take a certain amount of risk financially otherwise to transition? Oh, man. Okay. So when I was starting in 2006 is when I went to go get my real estate license. I was three months behind on my, I was, I was two months behind on my mortgage and I had just had a baby or not me, but my ex-wife did, which was my uh, middle daughter. And we, we had to pay $5,000 out of pocket mm. because I did not have insurance. So it was $5,000 that covered two days in the hospital and the birth. Um, and then I made a decision because I was working uh, at, at this company, I was selling office products for my own company. I was making maybe like three, four thousand dollars a month, and my lifestyle and everything was way more. So what I did was I said, I'm gonna go get my real estate license. And I did. And then I went to this pizza place called Fat Daddy's Pizza, where a guy named Robert Hammond I met, and he and I eventually partnered and we bought probably 130 houses in between 2007 and 2010, all real estate distressed assets. We ended up owning a portfolio of 54. I was able, just because I was willing to let my credit go bad for another 30 days, um, I hit my first deal the first month that I got my real estate license. And from then I was doing about, you know, uh, it went to three deals the next month and it went to six, then it went to 12. So yes, you you have to risk a little bit financially, but what I always tell people, and this is the reason why I love it's Quest, a calculated risk. It is a calculated risk, but when, what most investors do is they get their wholesale deal, right? <laughs> and then they go to the quest building on Tuesday morning so they can pitch their bull crap property <laughs> To all of the people who are also there to really pitch. And there, you have one or two people that would show up, really legitimate private lenders, legitimately mm -hmm. show up on those Tuesday morning classes. And what most people do is they, they tell you, it's like an ugly baby, right? Look at my baby. Oh my gosh, it's so pretty. It's, don't you think it's pretty? And everybody else is like, no, it's an ugly baby. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, most of the time babies are pretty. But the deal is, is that, no matter if, if you have enough babies, one of them is going to be pretty. And when you have a good deal in real estate, the deal always finds the money. It will always find the money. You, you know, it's funny. My first I ever did, I definitely over leveraged myself, but I didn't over leverage like cash wise. I over leveraged credit, which it sounds like you kind of did something similar. I, for my very first deal, I found the deal made sense, but I put the entire rehab on credit cards. Huh? No, I wasn't able to do that. What I over leveraged was I took 10% interest for my time and I went and gave 50% to a money guy and 40% to Robert Hammond who knew what he was doing. And I only got 10%. And my ex-wife made fun of me in front of her dad, who was also a real estate investor. And he said, if Curtis got zero and all he's getting is experience, in five years, he'll be a millionaire. So that's the thing too, is for my first deal, I it took a while to make some money, to be honest, because I screwed up. I made a lot of mistakes, but my biggest mistakes came down to not listening to people, listening Ooh, to people that so knew what they were doing. Yeah. You know, and I was like, ah, I know better. Oh yeah. I kind of, I, I half ass listen to, you know, the, uh, this podcast or this show or this speaker, but man, there's a lot of good knowledge out there that you can get for free yeah it's a lot like being in a toxic relationship uh i have been in one myself and i have friends that are in them and they want to tell you all about no you're wrong but she said this but she said that and i'm like why did the six other investors back out of this deal what you know you're telling me that the general contractor is telling you that this rehab is going to be twenty thousand dollars i'm going to tell you right now it's going to be forty right? No, no, no. You're wrong. You're so wrong. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I'm wrong because you're the guy who I've builds done, custom homes. <laughs> well, I've done, I've done 500 flips. I've built 47 custom houses. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> From your experience of doing one to 10 or zero, you're right. So 
as we kind of go through some of these questions, right, the next one is going to pop up here in just a minute Bloop. is uh, what are the quickest ways to generate deal flow? Oh, good. This is you know, so good. And I, how do how have I been able to use technology? Yeah. Okay. The number one way to generate deal flow is relationships. Mm -hmm. That's the this where people get wrong is real estate isn't about sticks and bricks. It's about people. And resources. Those are the two things. Um, my relationship with you has helped me tremendously. But you and I, in 2019, when I spoke at Quest Expo the first time, we didn't know each other that well. We didn't know. Yeah. It was you were getting up trying to sell. Um, you you were I I had won a whole bunch of tickets. By the way, if you are not going to the Quest Expo, you're an idiot. Okay. <laughs> you're an absolute <laughs> idiot. Where if, if you want to be where the money is, you have to pay for the privilege to be where the money is. These guys are putting the whole thing together. Not only that, but normally when y'all put this together, there's a casino night. Oh man, the casino night's so much fun. Free drinks, free gambling that the earnings pretty much go to uh, and, the, and you get to win yep. stuff. Absolutely. You get to win stuff. So I put all my eggs into the basket where what's the guy uh that uh blink lending? Yep, Paul. Paul Limnatos. Paul Limnatos yeah. was giving away a trip to Greece to go stay in like his family home or something like that. Yeah. And I put all of my tickets in there and I just started, uh, Derek got up with all this energy and was trying to, to, to I really thought I was going to win and I lost, but nevertheless, I had the best time. And that was the first event that I took my wife to, who was my girlfriend at the time. And um, she fell in love. So she did a deal. You helped her with that. Absolutely. Relationships. And that's the thing. Relationships. So that's one of the biggest things that people think is like, oh, you have to go out there and go door knocking or, you know, try to, you know, put those bandit signs up. So they, those can work. But usually where you find your best deals is through the relationship. Yeah. I have gone to so many networking events. And the number one thing I do is I tell people, well, I can solve your problem. Well, what's the problem? I don't know. Let me know what it is. Right. Because that's where you're going to find a deal. Your dad taught me something too. Your dad, um, I went to go ask him for money. He said, sure, I'll give you money. Mm -hmm. Tell me how much you need. Well, I think I'm going to need, he goes, nope, I'm not giving you money. <laughs> Come back to me when you know your numbers. Bam. Um, and, He's and, blunt too. Yeah. Well, yes, he, he is blunt. Uh, your dad is a wealth of information and he, the, the apple clearly doesn't fall far from the tree. You're a wealth of information. That's the reason why I've had you on my podcast so many times. Great energy. Um, you know, I want to thank people like, I, I can't believe Grant Cardone's on here and uh, someone named Anthony Robbins. So thank you guys for joining on this podcast to listen to me, real estate expert. <laughs> but so I, I think that uh, Facebook has helped me generate re uh, resources and relationships where per being able to be at every single event hasn't. And where most people fail is they get themselves and say, I'm just not good in front of people. I'm just not good at finding deals. I'm just not this. You really think that the deal is just waiting for you to get on to HAR and find it? <laughs> it? I wish it was that easy. It's not. If it was that easy, we'd all be doing it. Yeah. I mean, look, I hate wholesalers like everybody else does because they charge a lot of money. But I will tell you what. Every one of the last like 10 deals that I bought have been from a wholesaler and they've been from the same wholesaler. So that's the thing too, is unfortunately there's a lot of organizations out there and I'm going to call them the, uh, the RIA programs, you know, where they, uh, many of them have, they focused so heavily on wholesalers and they created over the last five to 10 years, this line of people that think that they're all wholesalers. You get one deal and everyone's trying to wholesale the wholesale of the wholesale. Every once in a while though, you can get a good wholesaler. If you can get that good guy, you know, who really knows what he's doing. He spent a year or two building up his buyer's list. You know, he knows his numbers because he's done contract work. That's a good wholesaler. There's nothing wrong with wholesalers. Yeah. And to speak to that, there is nothing wrong with wholesalers. You know, Eddie Gant started the super investor meeting. Eddie Gant from Jet Lending. You guys Ed, haven't used them. Gant, Check them out. Eddie Gant from Jet Lending. What I don't think Eddie Gant realized like he's doing the information to create other investors. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. But what he actually did was everybody, the smart people were looking around at the stage and going, well, the guy who has all the money to lend is the guy that's affording all the beer, 
the food, the venue, everything. Yep. So then what he really did was he created a bunch of private lenders. <laughs> and that is really the beauty of real estate investing in these RIA programs. You may think that you're trying to do this. You know what the guy I'm, I'm going to brag for a second. Cause another guy that I've had on my podcast twice, James taller. Oh, I know James. Yeah. James. Good beast. grief. Beast. Yeah. King, King James lending. Yep. So what James did was James started a RIA program, brought in all first timers, walks, finds the deals, walks them through the deals, then funds the deals. And then I also have to say, uh, Flipco, where but whereas where my wife works, you know, truth and disclosure, uh, Flipco, they have uh, done a great job with first time investors as well. Great, th those three places and probably Red Door Funding, those are my favorite places to go to borrow money. Real quick on the Flipco aspect, if you guys haven't been to one of their events, they have been packed lately. They yeah. really have, so check them out. Yeah, uh, yeah, Flipco is packed. I can't tell if it's because they hire only hot women <laughs> or if it's because of, you know, like the quality of the content, but, uh, did they hire your wife? They did. They okay. did. Okay. So they hire hot women. Um, and yeah, don't let this fool you. Uh, yeah. I, I, my, my wife was doing dishes the other day and I said, good thing you're hot. She looked at me and she said, good thing you're rich. <laughs> so touche. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> So uh, we're going to keep coming through. And guys, don't forget, we got a bunch of uh, now questions are starting to come in. I love this. Right, so we're going to tackle this one. In the Ooh, middle. good one. What is the biggest mistake you've seen investors make? And what was the biggest mistake you've made? Oh, my gosh. Okay. I can handle both of those easily. The first mistake that most investors make is they uh, they think that they know everything about the deal when they don't. Mm -hmm. They um, They try to solve the problem of. Uh, private lending first versus the beauty of actually having uh, a hard money lender look at your deal. Jet lending, I mean, as much as I really uh, get irritated by Rob Trigg, that dude is constantly promoting, hey, I'll look at your deal for free. I'll look at your deal for free all the time. And, and he does. He'll look at your deal and qualify it and make sure it's a good deal. Uh, in, if a hard money lender is willing to put their time out there and their money out there on a deal, it's because they verified the asset. So that's one of the things too, I think people don't take advantage of. If you're not sure if you have a deal, give it to one of the hard money lenders. They will let you know because they get paid by lending you money. Yeah. And they're only going to lend you money if it is a deal. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, uh, here's another mistake that people make. They think that their contractor, just because they give them a good price that's really going to be the price at the end of the deal. Yeah, uh, it's not. I have done tons of flips. Rarely does the number equal below what I've budgeted. Most of the time, it goes over. Right now, we're dealing with a huge lumber crisis again. For some reason, OSB is like forty-one dollars a sheet, and Tech Shield is fifty-four dollars a sheet. So if you're doing you know, like I was budgeting 225 for a roof, a brand new roof with decking everything. And now I am at probably like 250, 255. So, you know, it, but the go back to that question. What was the biggest mistake that I made? The biggest mistake that I made was I bought a property from New Western Acquisitions, wholesaler company. Yep, wholesaler company. I bought it from Kayla Wojciak, the girl that started Flipco. I bought it from Kayla when Kayla worked at, at uh, I call it NWA, New Western Acquisitions. <laughs> NWA, I, NWA <laughs> the rap group. So I, I bought from Kayla and I started renovating this property. It was already 2,100 square feet. And I, someone came to me and tried to do an off market deal with me and get the property. And then they said, Oh, we want to make a second story. And I did that. And I ran through my numbers thinking that I knew my budget and I had to redemo the property. I hired a contract crew that I wasn't familiar with. Yep. They ran off with $20,000 of my, my money. And, and honestly, this is me being in real estate 10 years at this point. Like I know the game. I should have known better. You know, no matter what, you're always going to make a mistake eventually. Yeah. Uh, and perfect. 
So the people who made money on that deal, Noble Mortgage made 50,000 bucks on me on holding costs and extension fee. I walked away from closing paying $60,000, Ryan DeGeneres and I did, to close that deal out. See, one of my biggest mistakes I think I've ever made was not knowing when to walk away. And sometimes that's the hardest thing to do. I was trying to force a deal to work where I went to like, in my head, everything made sense. I did the numbers. I swear to God, the, this made sense. We can make this happen. Every lender, private lender, every hard money lender, you name it, refused to lend me money on the deal. Well, it means it's bad. And I didn't want to walk away because I already put up my earnest money. Right. And that's all it was, is walking away. I was going to lose ego. the earnest money. Your ego. And yeah, sometimes just knowing, hey, look, it's okay to walk away. You're not going to be able to knock everyone out of the park. So, And, and if we go back to, if we rewound this tape a little bit, what was the first thing, the biggest problem that most new investors make? They think they know everything. Absolutely. You know, and, and even when you are experienced, that's your worst. That That's like the worst part. Most of these guys now, they're really good at the low end stuff, but then they see, oh, someone's hitting a hundred grand over there in the Heights. I'm going to transition and go to the Heights. I remember Brant Phillips, his company was called Rent Ready Properties. Brant and I have done flipping classes together. Yep. Brant's done individual flipping classes at Brant. Uh, I was actually, uh, I sent him for one of his mentor programs back in like 2017 and he helped me get started in real estate. Yeah. Brant ended up buying uh, a project from me. He wanted to do townhomes. Mm -hmm. He still owns one of those townhomes today, four years later. It, he was sat on my podcast with me. I would suggest going back and listen to it. It was a great podcast where Brant said um, that was the worst deal I ever made. Like he, if he were to go back and do it, he wouldn't have done it. Yeah. We got a question popped up from Elizabeth. Uh, what are some recommendations on investing in tax liens? Ooh, I'm the wrong guy for that. Maybe you're the, I, I don't, I don't invest in tax liens. So there's a guy named Arnie Abramson. Okay. If you want, I can do an email introduction, but he's fantastic in it. Most of the time where I see people fail with tax liens is they're trying to do everything themselves. And you have to understand that if you're looking at tax deeds or liens, depending on the state, the county that you're in, uh, most of them, it's going to come down to a long holding period. Now, if there's a longer holding period, you want to make sure that you're not investing hundreds of thousand dollars in something. What Arnie does is he actually says, hey, he's a professional. Like this is what he's built his whole career on. He goes down to the tax auctions and stuff. He and he has a pool of money. Now, if everyone is in there and he's the only one bidding, though, because he knows what he's doing. Every, everyone will get a percentage on the tax things they can actually close on and get profit from. Wow. So that's good. Yeah. So the, the downside to it is though, is most tax things take longer than people think you run into issues that you would never expect. And most of them are title issues, probate issues, uh, first, second, third, fourth liens that you weren't even understanding that are always going to be there. So if you know what you're doing, if you don't mind paying some attorney fees, tax things are great. However, make sure you have a good mentor. Make sure you have someone that's there to hold your hand. And uh, I can introduce you to Ar Arnie if you'd like, Elizabeth. So I love your question. Yeah, Keep them a, coming, guys. That was a good question because I do not know anything about tax liens. Uh, but I would caution people, when, you're, when, when the guy you're listening to knows everything about everything, that is a red flag. Yep. Uh, I mean, I don't know half of the other stuff that are going on in real estate. I barely know anything about cryptocurrency <laughs> and I talk to you about it a ton. Yeah. And so, I, I mean, it's what you don't know can hurt you. Mm -hmm. Honesty will get you everywhere. Just me saying, Hey, I've never done a, a commercial job before the honesty in that people find refreshing. Okay. Well, yeah. what do you, what, how different would it be? And see, that's the thing too, is sometimes it's, Maybe you don't know the answer, but maybe you know who does. You know where to find it, right? Like I've never bought a tax deed or lien, but I know Arnie has. If I have questions about it, I pass people to him. I give him a call. The number you know? one thing that we just said, people and resources, relationships and resources. Yeah. Notice everything comes back to the same thing. It's Relationship. your network. Yep. Well, now, I this means that you need to be going to events. Well, this means that... If your goal is to not use hard money and mm -hmm. to work with private money, then your goal should be to already have 
uh, logged on to the Quest Expo and to got yourself a ticket. By the way, I'm probably going to be speaking at the Quest Expo. And if I'm not, I probably just put myself on stage. So <laughs> I think that's what you did last time. We're like, yeah, come on, let's go. No, <laughs> no. You, uh, yeah, yeah. Haley Gant invited me. Oh, is that what happened? Yeah, I, it I, was I... it was me versus uh, Michael Plax. Oh, yeah. And, and Michael is like he hates Privet, Michael. <laughs> yeah, he hates. Yeah, his country is invading Ukraine. So good job, Michael. Way to ruin it for everybody. All right. So I got one that I think you and I love okay. to talk about. All right, let's do it. Hopefully this is Dave Ramsey. Well, look at that. <laughs> oh, wait. Nope. Wait, that was the wrong. Actually, you know what? We'll talk about okay. the Dave Ramsey one. Okay. I have 10 day in my I have 10 day in my IRA. What is the best way to start flipping? Now, if we ignore the term IRA, you have 10K. What is the best way to start flipping? What What do you think? If I have 10K, okay. Um, Man, I would partner with somebody personally. There you go. 10K, 10K really doesn't provide you or a hard money lender, any flexibility with you to, to do the deal. See, that's the thing is I think too many people, they are under the impression they can get into this investment, uh, get into real estate with only 10K. Now I have a class that I teach that is called how to invest with 10K or less, but it, a lot of it has to deal with partnering, bringing in an expert, someone who knows what they're doing and you have to give up something, meaning most of the time I'm giving up equity in the deal. And that's something that I think a lot of times people, they'll walk away from a deal Instead of making 50% on it because they didn't want to bring in somebody. And, and this is rags to riches. I mean, when I started the, the this podcast or this uh, lunch and learn, it was all about, I gave up 90% of the deal to gain the experience. Mm -hmm. I did that for three years. And people don't get it. They, they don't want to give up something because they're like, whoa. Because I need to be rich tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. It takes time. It, you cannot microwave success today. No. You just can't. And honestly, I mean, I bought lotto tickets before <laughs> and I, I didn't win. You're, the probability of winning is very low. The probability of you being new with $10,000 in your account and finding the home run is very low. It is. Does it happen? Absolutely. You can always find those success stories, but so I like that question. Now, here's the one that I always say is, uh, I think our debate with a lot of people okay. via Dave Ramsey. I almost said Gordon Ramsey, the chef. <laughs> Gordon Ramsey, yeah. But pros and cons of debt leveraging. Now, the biggest thing I always hear from people is Dave Ramsey says you should never debt leverage. What do you, you think? You hear that from people? That's really something people are telling you? Man, what the heck? So what do you think? Uh, I have become everything that I am today financially because of debt leveraging. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think it goes back to what you were saying, you know, there's smart debt and then there's dumb debt. Credit card is dumb debt. Y'all. <laughs> well, I, okay. So let's, let's go with this. This is where we're going to differ. Everything that I put is on a credit card. Ooh, ooh, Every I do the same thing. thing. I do the same thing. And it's what, free money. Ah, okay. And wh wh where's the free money? Tell me, tell them about the free money. So first off, there's two aspects to it. One, I like to show that my personal checking account always has a lot of cash in it. This way, if I have to take a loan from a real lender, all right, it looks good. But I'm going to let you know when I'm using my credit card, I never spend more than what's in my checking account so I could pay it off. But that's not where the free money comes into play. No, it's not. No, the free money comes in if you're going to use a credit card is you want one that gives you some sort of cash back, some sort of reward, something for using it. Because on average, I probably say I make an extra three grand a year just on cash rewards from using your credit card that you pay off 100% each year or each month. You know, it's free money. Like, oh, use our credit card. We'll give you cash back. And it's because they're betting on that you're not going to pay it off. So the other thing that you're not talking about is... Um, so if I use a debit card, mm -hmm. when does that money come out right away? When I use my credit card, how long do I have to float? 30 days, 30 typically. days. Yeah. We'll call it 30 days. I mean, you know, so let's say that you only had 10 K, mm -hmm. but you have a credit card that has five to $10,000. Well, now you could go to Derek or you could go to me or you could go to a hard money lender. And now you you legitimately really have twenty thousand dollars of available cash that you can use to throw at a deal. Mm -hmm. 
that gets you through your first draw. If you could find a property, let's say that's 80,000 bucks. There you go. Okay. And you could do the deal yourself. I would suggest not doing that deal, but that's the pro and con or, or that's the pro of debt. The con of debt or partnering or whatever is you're reducing your total take home. Absolutely. So one of the things that I think is a big con is people getting too much debt too quickly, right? My goal is like, I won't do any cash out refis. What do you think of that? Oh, I love cash out refis. See, do you want to know why? Why? Free money. So it resets all of my timetables. I only do a cash out refi up to 60% of the home value. I keep 40% equity in all my homes. Okay. I only do a cash out refi up to 65%. Okay. So same thing pretty much. Yeah. Okay. But what do I get taxed on my refi when I pull the cash out? Nothing. Okay. That's free money. It is. Okay. What do they call the money that's sitting in equity inside of your house? Dead there. equity. There. And see, I think, unfortunately, Dave Ramsey has pushed so hard on a lot of the bad debts and stuff that people consider that bad debt. Okay. Who do you want to follow? A guy that was in Tennessee as a real estate investor and lost like 3 million bucks as a bad real estate investor, but sold you through credit cards, sold you books, tapes, CDs, and seminars. Or do you want to go and follow two lug nuts who somehow were able to, you know, make it in the world of real estate or other creative investment strategies. And they did it through hard work, resourcing, networking, basically the same thing that you guys are doing on a daily basis. Also, I'm, I, I've got six projects going on right now. I have six. I'm not here telling you about what I did three years ago. Thank you, Damon. Boom. Look at that. <laughs> you know, Dave Ramsey is telling you about not getting into real estate from something he did 15 years ago before real estate went on sale for like 50 cents on the dollar, 30 cents on the dollar. I made my whole entire Steve Davis is as much as some people. Steve Davis runs total wealth. guys. Yeah. He, he runs total wealth Academy, which is we're here in the studio. Steve has a great little philosophy. He says in real estate, what happened? Someone asked him this question in a, in a live Q and a, they said, well, what happens when the market goes up? He goes, I don't care. <laughs> what happens when the market goes down? I don't, I don't care. care. <laughs> he says, heads up. I win tails. I win. It doesn't matter that when the market starts going up, I sell. When the market goes down, I hold buy and hold. I, and I actually, what I start doing is I amplify my purchasing because as the market's going down, I am getting it ready to start buying these properties at deeper discounts. Now I will say, and the difference between you and me is I currently own three rentals. All right. Okay. Now with these three rentals, I there's have two. A, all right. So there's a reason I won't debt leverage more than the 60% is I want, if I go to take another loan that I show, I have a lot of equity, all right? And this can help down the road if you're trying to get some. Now, if I had 10 properties, okay, I'd probably be more open to okay, I'm gonna, cashing out. I'm going to fight Derek on this. You guys didn't come here to see, see two it's, guys grab ass and, and agree with each other. <laughs> okay. What do you think the, the bank really wants to see more of? Cash available. Oh, cash available. Absolutely. Okay. So if I could go to 70% or 80%, if I can get another 30 grand. And now I've got, let's say I had 50,000 in the, in, in the uh, bank account, mm -hmm. but I could show 80 if I would have just gone to 75 or 80% cash out refi, which is what's allowed. Now I'm not a hundred percent of this, but I believe too, if you are going to do a cash out refi, you can pull out up to a half a million uh, and it's still tax free. Now, if you go above that, I, I think it's, it is taxable, but I'm not sure about that. I'm fairly certain it's up to that. Now, this could differ per state. You're 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 just you're borrowing debt. That's all you're doing. Right. You're borrowing debt. I know that people cash out on commercial buildings like apartment complexes all the time and and all they're talking about is resetting the the you know, the criteria on the 
on the um I'm gonna, the depreciation scale. We might have to ask Robert Robert Martinez. I bet you he'd know. Robert Martinez, a big uh, multifamily guy. Yeah, Robert Martinez, or even uh, the dreaded Michael Plax. Yeah, yeah, the CPA Michael Plax. I bet you he's busy this time of year. <laughs> oh yeah, we're getting ready to be in tax season. Oh, actually, I filed my taxes. This is the first time in the last four or five years that I've gotten done, or like I'm already done. Okay. That, yeah. I don't think I've filed my taxes on time in like the last, uh, I don't know, seven, eight years. Yeah. Oh, I love this question because. Who cares? That's my answer to your question. When do you think the market is going to soften? I think I, the market may be softening. So I think we have to areas. define softening. Ooh, that's but, a good one too. But I don't, I don't think it's, so, it's going to soften like you think. It for what do I think it's going to soften too? That's the thing is the reason the market has skyrocketed so much is for the most part, people, there isn't enough homes available right now. Right. So why then would tomorrow, oh, suddenly there's a hundred homes if there's only one today. Okay. Yeah, let me throw this back at you. If I'm, if I'm watching this podcast and I'm in California or New York, mm -hmm. the market may be softening. Sure. In, and the reason is, is there's a mass exodus to Texas. Yep. If you're asking me when in Texas. Is the market going to soften? I don't know. Um, let's say the market's going to soften if 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 I'm in Galveston or Meyerland and we're in the middle of hurricane season. It and there's a hurricane that comes in and floods that entire area. Then maybe we're going to be dealing with a softening market. Uh, it market specific, street specific. Yep. So, and that's the thing is sometimes people think, oh, the market's going to crash. It's going to crash. Man, if you're waiting for the market to crash, yeah, this isn't your industry. <laughs> yeah. I, there's a lot of people. Oh, I'm stockpiling cash right now. Why? Why? <laughs> Hoarding cash so you can lose like 7% uh, inflation. Is there a good question coming up? It is. And it's not real estate related. So I'm curious to see what our thoughts are, but okay. sorry. Let's to... do it. Well, what I just said was if you're sitting on cash, then you're losing seven and a half percent or more. Yep. You got to be almost making 10, 12 percent. And it seems like just to be kind of going above inflation. Yeah. And and making a good profit. So um, I actually own a couple of stocks. And one of the stocks that I do own pays a dividend monthly. OK, OK. That's uh, rare nowadays. It, it pays a monthly dividend against oil futures. All right. This month, and it trades at five dollars a share, and it pays out seventeen cents per share. It's twenty eight percent. That's not bad. But it fluctuates. Yep. Like uh, last month, it was fluctuate. fourteen cents. Yep. Two years ago, it was it was it paid out a dividend of uh, two dollars, but it was trading at like nineteen bucks a share. There you go. So I'm just saying, like you can. Per, you do. You need to have your money working and accelerating and making money for you. Absolutely. So you ready for the Yeah, let's do this question. This, this one just popped up. What is the difference in value between crypto and gold? Hmm. Well, um, the, well, one, you... Okay, I'm going to tell you the difference in value. The difference in value is when are you walking around with uh, with a block of gold to go in exchange that for a good or service yep. the difference in the value is the transferability in the ease of transferring you have to go dig up the gold they do have to mine for bitcoin yep. they have to mine for ethereum mm -hmm. but guess what you can easily go to a place called coinbase or voyager or any of these other uh forex crypto Dot com you can go wherever you want and you can acquire those coins hold it into a cold storage wallet and then you can turn around and use your wallet to pay for things like movie tickets if you had dogecoin so my thing is and i'm going to purposely play devil's advocate I, all right that's fine yep i'm actually not a big fan of crypto now i know you're not yep but it's because i like to, i like to invest in something i can hold I can feel, see, You touch. can still hold that. I think there's debate on because I can, this is gold, right? Oh, all that being said, though, 
I don't own any gold. This is why I like real estate. And I try to focus on real estate, but I don't know. The gold standard is kind of, it's, I think it's gone. Well, I mean, they, they say it's there, but it's, it's gone. I, I still think gold is a valuable resource. Silver is a valuable resource. Gold's good in electronics, if you didn't know. That's about what it's used for. <laughs> Silver's in a lot of electronics. It's also a part of the lithium process to, to do rechargeable batteries, right? So you, you uh, lithium, right? That's another good resource. Titanium, platinum. So palladium, all of those things are, are good resources. Where I wouldn't be putting my money long-term is in oil. It, by 2030, they're saying that everything is going to be electric. So did you see that there was one Super Bowl commercial this year? Did you watch Super Bowl? Yes. Yeah. So uh, I had money on the Bengals. Aw. I haven't liked the Bengals since Ocho, Ocho Cinco. Child, please. Child. <laughs> okay. All right. Yes, I watched it to watch all those over. <laughs> to, to watch... Uh, <laughs> 75 cent or 50 cent, whatever he, boy, he, inflation hit that boy hard. It did. <laughs> he, <laughs> that was a unique show. He has my body type. <laughs> but uh, one commercial really did stick out about that. And when you say oil gas is the Chevy commercial. Yes. There was a Chevy commercial and they said all electric and they were pushing hardcore, moving 100% to electric trucks cars suvs vans and it shows the whole lineup and it was one of those things like whoa are they taking a big step i'm not a big chevy guy but it seems like they're taking a big step towards uh, ford and gmc have both said that they will be all electric by 2030 and that's something to take note of you yeah know? and i own oil and gas actually as of right now my best investment i have is an oil and gas investment because you still have to have oil and gas in order to produce electricity that's going to generate the power for your vehicles yeah. either way you go you still have to use oil and gas yep and guess what they ain't making right now they're not making ev airplanes <laughs> they're not using uh elon musk ain't using tesla to boost the rocket up into the atmosphere you need something got a pretty good question here I like this one uh because every year this answer changes for me and i'm wondering if it does for you too what are some things you are investing in today you never would have even thought you would have been be investing in? Crypto. Really? Crypto. Um, the stock market. I've got like 20 or 30 stocks that I've got. Um, what's another one? Um, oh, I bought a Tesla. See, you, you know, for me, uh, understand that I come from real estate, right? And I've always focused on single family homes, single family this. Okay. Whether it's a fix this and flip, good. whether it's a rental. When I say single family homes, I also mean notes. I like to Ooh, lend money. Yeah. Right. I'm a note guy. I like to I like to be that lender. So my wife has a note. Yep. It, because you were, you sat down with us at lunch mm -hmm. and bam, she went and did a note. Yeah. So yeah, notes too. I never thought we would be in a position to do notes. Right. And notes are great. It's it's a easy way to make passive income. However, working at Quest, I have an unfair advantage. We have so many clients right now doing what we call a PE deal or a syndication, right? Someone is raising capital for that multifamily deal, raising capital for that storage unit. And some of those returns have become insane. They really have. And I would never four or five years ago, probably invested into a syndication where now I'm wishing I would have. And it's something to consider. The problem I think though comes down to with a lot of those people raising capital, you got to know you're working with the right person, you know? So. Uh, something that I never thought I would be investing in is, um, I, I'm in contract to buy a building on the strand in Galveston, an old historic building. Never in my wildest imagination did I ever think I would ever own something so historic, something so kick-ass in one of the most bougiest places. Yeah. I wouldn't say bougie, but you know, it's kind of Soho. It's, it's neat though, isn't it? Yeah. When have you been able to walk around and here's and, and be friends with someone and go, oh yeah, they own a building on the French Quarter. Well, basically, I own a building on the French Quarter of Texas. There you like go. the Strand. <laughs> I mean, they're having the Mardi Gras parade right there for yeah. Christ's sake. That's awesome. Yeah, no, it's 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 a big deal. How can I go about using 
four hundred and one thousand dollars for investing. I think they're saying four hundred one k, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, uh, Patricia, I love this question. Obviously, um, I'm assuming this is more for me than you, Curtis. But, bro, take it. <laughs> it's all you. Uh, well, your four hundred one k. Most of the time, you have to already have left your job. All right. You have to be, you know, have that separation of service or be the right age before you can move over your 401k. Now, assuming that has happened, it's pretty simple. Call any one of our IRA specialists. They're going to either A, set you up a solo 401k or B, move it into a IRA that lets you just do any of the investments we're talking about here, whether it's the cryptocurrency that's coming up right around the corner for us or syndications, nodes, fix and flips, rentals, lending, you name it. So step one, you usually have to have separation of service. So uh, great question. And always reach out to our IRA specialists. It's free. They'll help you out in those areas if you want to dive into those more often. So thank you, Patricia. Boom. So we're kind of caught up on questions for right now. We'll get a couple more, but we only got about 10 minutes left, Curtis. Perfect. So any last minute thoughts for the individuals online? Yes. I think that you, um, if you haven't gotten your Quest Expo ticket yet, you should go ahead and get a Quest Expo ticket. And if you haven't noticed, I get paid commission on every ticket that I'm selling. He doesn't. <laughs> no. I just, but the, the reason why I'm saying it and stressing it so hard is because Quest changed my life. The resources that were there, the people who I met, the opportunities to speak on stage after, I mean, realize it took me seven years before your dad asked me one time to get up on stage. You're a natural at it too. I, I appreciate that. But the, my point was I was a natural at it back then too, but I did not have, I, I, I didn't have the scars and the bruises and, and, and the, the trophies, right? Yep. It took experience in order to be able to do that. And I've seen, I've seen many people come and go in this industry. I've seen people come and speak at Quest and then never speak again. I saw people speaking at Quest. I remember that there was a guy that I kept looking at the whole time. And he had a company and he was doing a ton of deals. And he was there every Tuesday getting new investors. And that guy ended up no longer in business. And I was like, that's my competition. And I was, and I just kept thinking, I looked at other people for so long. I looked at them and I said, oh man, they're doing so much more than me. They're doing so much better than me. How are they doing this? You know, it, it, the numbers don't make sense. And sometimes when the numbers don't make sense, you got to realize that Facebook is lying to you. There's a lot of people that we know who are not doing what they, look yeah. at all the money. Uh, come on, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> look at the real wealthy, the real rich people, man. They're not out there. Also, look, where, it like look where they're parking their Bentley and look how old their Bentley is. Did I get the Bentley for 24 grand? And I, am I parking it in a $150,000 house? I mean, this is what you need to look at on Facebook. Facebook should not be your, it, it, Facebook should be an accountability tool, it should not be a believability tool. You need to look the people who have the most to lose. First of all, I always love contractors who are active on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Being active on Facebook gives you a sense of, of social security, the real social security, because it lets me know this person is constantly like his business is, you know, perpetuated mm -hmm. on social media. That's the right word, right? Perpetuate. I like that word. Propelled. Yeah, stick with that. Propelled. It, 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 it's ongoing through that. So I would say use social media as a believability tool or not believability, but like an accountability tool. Is this person, is this person's livelihood and reputation attached to social media? Would they have a lot to lose if they lost my money? Yes. Then invest. I always say, uh, if you're going to lend someone money, they got to have a, and I stole this term from Paul, uh, Paul and Nottles at Blink Lenny, but they have the big throat to choke. You know, Ooh. like, like, hey, do they have something to lose? Can you go after them for X, Y, Z? Is this something that could ruin the reputation? Are they worried about their reputation? And if they're not worried about it. Yeah, I'm scared. I would be scared of the person who is not worried about their reputation. Yeah. So uh, I know you have a podcast. Uh, it's nailed it. Yes. Right. 
Uh, you bring in speakers pretty consistently that talk about all sorts of topics from real estate, cryptocurrency, stock. I mean, you name it. And you do this pretty frequently. How often do you do your nailed it podcast? We, we record on Tuesdays at 1030 and then they probably go out like a week or two. So like this one, we're also simultaneously simultaneously recording so this one will go out now you will be your this is number five for you i think so yeah yeah this is your fifth time uh what we try to do is take in local entrepreneurs business owners uh people i i believe that derek even though he is a employee at quest he is an entrepreneur he's taking what he teaches and actively nailing it every month by participating in other people's deals. And also when I bring him on, uh, everybody that comes on the podcast, there is zero of these, there, there's zero questions ahead. We don't do, yep. we do a very raw interview each time. Yep. That's why I was looking forward to this because he just said, you'll never believe this, but we're going to be able to talk about cryptocurrency on the next lunch and learn. And I was so excited because mm -hmm. I can't wait to dive in deeper and know more about I I know very surface level stuff about crypto. So in the next few weeks what's going to happen at Quest is we're bringing in experts, all right, that run cryptocurrency companies, all right, and run those things that like, you know, the companies that set up the wallets for you and things to talk about crypto, to talk about what it is, what the security is, what it looks like to do the mining, wh where you can buy it, when you can sell it, where you can spend it, etc. So uh that's a big step for us I think here at Quest that we're taking because a lot of us out there like me, I'll probably never take that full leap, but you got to diversify. You absolutely should be diversifying your portfolio. You should be looking, hey, maybe I have some money in real estate. Maybe I have some money in oil and gas. Maybe I should have some money in cryptocurrency, you know? So, well, Curtis, thank you so much. You know, we appreciate you being on this platform. Thanks for talking so much about the expo. You know, uh, if you guys do want to get tickets to the expo, let us know. Uh, can I give one last shout out real quick? Absolutely. Okay. Um, if you're in the Houston area, I will be speaking. I'm doing a flipping class, uh, on creating deals, like where deals are created. I'm doing it at the total wealth Academy on February the 22nd at six 30, Alyssa stone. And I will be talking. Then I also am doing a take no, like just letting uh, letting no not be the, the, the stopping point, right? Like no excuses. It's a no excuses mindset uh, class on March the 4th Ooh. at 6.30. Where can they register for that class? I don't know if they can register. You're free to come. It's uh, totalwealth.com. Hold on. Let's see if we can't put that. Totalwealthacademy.com. Sorry. Boom. Yeah. Boom. Love it. Okay. I'm sorry. I was interrupting your closing statement. You got it. So hold on. We're just getting a... Uh... I just want to put it up there real fast so people can see. So totalwealth dot, uh, totalwealthacademy.com. Head to that website, and you can go ahead and see Curtis and Alyssa. Both uh, Alyssa's amazing. She's not on here right now, but uh, she's done a lot. Yeah, so, she's done a lot. Uh, what are the dates for the expo? That's going to be September 23rd through the 25th. Uh, once again, guys, if you want tickets to this, it's an absolute must-go. We will be selling out. People always wait to the last minute, and then I feel bad. I get all these calls and say, hey, I want a VIP ticket. Hey, I need this. I need... Can't, you know, we had a thousand, we have room for a thousand people and that might seem like a lot, but boy, does that sell out fast. So it does, but it's worth it. Absolutely. So Curtis, thanks again. I appreciate it guys. Uh, make sure you check him out. Totalwealthacademy.com and, uh, nailed it. Yep. And nailed it. Check nailed out his it. podcast. So thanks Curtis. All right, guys. Thank Bye you. everybody.